Hi, my name is Joe Jackson. I'm a journalist, author, interviewer and broadcaster. I also happen to be someone who loves and that at times has lived for music ever since I was a child. Better still, I'm a music lover who was blessed to be able to become an interviewer purely to track down some of my music heroes to talk with, starting with Leonard Cohen in 1985. In fact, I went on to interview, among the 1,400 celebrities I've interviewed, most of my music heroes. And many musicians I interviewed became heroes of mine after meeting them. Either way, one of the great joys during an interview with a singer or musician is when I get to ask them about a recording I love. What follows as part of what I call my singles podcast, because they last less than five minutes or thereabouts, is me discussing one such song with one such musician. By the way, if you want to gain access to the full tapes for personal use or professional use, for example, in a documentary, as has been the case, you can contact me via my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com. All right, OK, I want to play another of those songs. We can move to, uh, I mean, people like the names, anyone who knows the history of pop will recognise uh, you were Billy Bryan for a time, Tommy, Edward, Tommy Edwards, Steve Lawrence, uh, were covering your stuff, and the Kalen Twins. I mean, right. this was kind of kicking, kick-starting your career at that level at a very early... Yeah, they weren't big hits. Right. Uh, the people were picking up on them, and I found out something at the same time that my publisher told me. He said, you know, you're writing great songs, but he said, we have to be very careful here because nobody can sing some of them. And I didn't even oh, think about range. it. Yeah, I was putting songs that I was writing into like a three octave range, and people were getting them and saying, forget it, you know, I can't go there. So. <laughs> okay, so it was limiting for them. I want to play, I know Rubber Ball was a hit, but I'm going to jump by that because I want to go to Ricky Nelson's Hello Mary Lou. Right. And what I find intriguing about this is the double vocal. I'm look, talking about those rock histories. I read one this morning, which said when you started double tracking your voice, you were trying to be the Beatles. But you and Neil Sedaka encoded it long before that. And I think, in fact, you did a song to one of Neil Sedaka's backing tracks, did you? Yeah, It Hurts to Be In Love, <laughs> right, which I sang. $46, I believe, the session cost. Oh, it was, uh, I went into the publisher, and I said, you know, I got a session coming up, play me some songs. And he played me It Hurts to Be In Love with Sedaka singing. And I said to him, that's a hit record. I said, why are you playing me that? And what happened was, what happens a lot, is that Sedaka had just changed labels, record labels. And the new production team didn't want any baggage coming with him from the old team. And that's where that song came from. It was produced at the, the, okay. the label before. So did you just use the music and take his two voices off? I said to him, you know, to um, Donnie Kirshner, the publisher, I said, that's so good, I can't make it any better. I said, can I use the track? <laughs> so he called me two days later and said, I got it. You can have the track if you put it out as an A-side, you know. Oh, that's great. So I found out who the girl was answering, Neil, uh, Tony Wine, who okay. went on to her own success later on writing. And uh, I went into the same studio, Dick Charles Studio on 7th Avenue, and used his track and sang it exact. That's Gene Pitney singing Neil Sedaka, right down the line. <laughs> okay, so that double tracking idea was something that Sedaka had done. That was something he was, he was playing with too, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Neil, a double harmony line like you still use in the concert. Yeah, Neil, Neil used harmony all the time. And yeah. uh, we talked but double about tracking it. his own voice. Yeah, well, yeah, well, a lot of that was done. Uh, the reason for it when I first did it was because it was the way I wanted the song presented to another artist. And I could do it in the studio. I, like, I played piano on the yeah. things. I played piano only because we had no money. Okay. So I played guitar, I played piano, I played drums, and I sang like seven voices. You know, <laughs> Did you pay yourself union rates? <laughs> yeah, yeah. $30 <laughs> or something like that for everything. So Hello Mary Lou had that feel and sound too, and it still stands as a classic pop song. Hello Mary Lou is the biggest copyright that I've ever had. Uh, it's amazing what that went to. And I tried to analyze it because the A side of the release in the States was Traveling Man. Oh, right. Okay. Hello, Mary Lou was the B-side. You didn't write Traveling Man, did you? No. Um, can't remember can't who. Think of his name. Yeah. But uh, Hello, Mary Lou went on to be successful in virtually every country in the world by, like, for instance, Johnny Holiday in France, okay. uh, Adriano Celentano in uh, Italy, uh, Jean and Keld in Germany, and they were all like million sellers in their own country, okay. which created it as a huge copyright, which now, 40 years later, it's amazing what that thing still brings in, you know. For, for you. For, yeah, I mean, I could live on send, it. Send your kids through college. For, oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but it's, uh, well, I mean, it's simple. Everybody saw a Mary well, Lou at some point in their life. That's the point I was going to make, though, is that I think that the simplicity of the song, that all of these people, again, no range. It doesn't really go up. It doesn't really go down. It no. stays pretty much in the middle. You, you know? learned your lesson. <laughs> yes, exactly. I learned it well. <laughs> if you want to eat, it's two simple songs. <laughs> But it is the idea. We've all seen a Mary Lou, and had you seen a Mary Lou, was this a mythical creature? 
I, I'll briefly tell you a, a quick story, not okay. to take up too much time. Okay. I had a beach club for oh, 25 years that I, I bought. It was a labor of love. It was something I worked at as a cook. And uh, a friend of mine that was uh, much older than I am and who was an actual member of the club, we talked one day at a, a mutual friend's house and said, let's buy this place. It's a wreck, completely derelict, and see if we can put it back together. Anyway, we did. Uh, I was there one night, and there was this guy that I recognized from school. I didn't really know him in school, but I knew his face, you know. Well, it took him about four or five drinks. He, I forget what he was there for, some function. And he walked up to me and he said, you know that song you wrote, Mary Lou? And I said, yeah. He said, you wrote that about Mary Lou Stillette, didn't you? And right then and there, I knew that if I said no, I was going to burst this guy's bubble. Because I haven't seen him now, let's say, for 25 years, right? Okay, yeah. He's had this in his head, that I wrote this about a girl that we went to school with. How I remember her name, I don't know. I didn't even know All her right. very well. All right, you know? okay. Oh. So I thought, how do I get out of here? How do I get out of this? So I just told him, I said, look, there's some things that you don't tell. There's some secrets that you don't give away. And I, I got out of there as quick as I could. Okay, and I am not going to ask you all these years later to give away the secret. Let's just hear the song. Yeah, all right. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Hi, Joe Jackson here again. I thank you for listening to this edition of the Joe Jackson Interviews podcast. And don't forget, if you want to gain access for personal or professional use to the full tape of that chat, contact me via my website, joejacksoninterviewer.com.